All right, well, you see, uh, you see that. I hope you got the statistics that are there. I mean, did you see that? There's 320 million people in the United States. Uh, only less than 20% of the population attends church on any given Sunday. 150,000 people leave the church every week. That's something, isn't it? I mean, it's staggering to think about. The Lord's blessed us by allowing people to come here and our congregation to grow. And we need to be thankful for that. Because people are leaving the church. People don't want anything to do with the church. And people are dying every day and spending an eternity away from God. And so many times all we care about are ourselves. And what we want and what we care about. And we need to start thinking about other people. The Lord wants His church to grow. He wants that. It's all throughout Scripture from the very beginning in Acts chapter 2. It says there were 3,000 people. The first church started as a mega church. 3,000. And then the next number we have, we're going through it on Wednesday night, we've got 5,000. 5,000 it says. The church kept growing. It says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved on a daily basis. How was He doing that? Other church people were excited about Jesus and they were telling others about Him and what He had done for them. The Lord's church needs to grow. We here at Eastern Pines, we've experienced some growth. And I'm, I'm excited about it. I said when I came here, uh, it be three years in December. I got some Hall Branch people here. Y'all uh, missed it. It seems like 15 years, though. I mean, y'all, after a week I was gone. You couldn't believe it. But, uh, but it'd be three years in December. And I said when I came here, I said, I will not be a maintenance minister. Nothing wrong with maintenance. We're going to maintain, we're going to do things. But I said, I will not be a maintenance minister. DJ's not going to do it. I'm not here to maintain anything. I'm going to, be, I'm going to stand before the Lord one day. And I'm going to give an account of what I've done here. And when He comes and finds me, I want to be found faithful, working for Him, inviting people, telling people about Jesus, and I want to present His bride, the church, one that is growing and one that is vibrant. And if the Scripture was still being written today, I would want the Eastern Pines Church of Christ to be written about. Amen. Just like the church at Philippi. The Apostle Paul loved this church. I mean, he loved all the church, but he loved this church. He said, I thank my God every day for you and for what you're doing in the kingdom. And this, this church gives us a glimpse on what we need to be doing and what we need to be focused on as a church. See, this congregation was established in 1979, officially in 1980, 1979, the workings began. 1980, it officially uh, became uh, uh, incorporated or together. There's paperwork on all of those things. And we have some of the original members here today at Homecoming. So we're looking at 33 years later. And uh, if you're an original charter member, if you would please stand at this time. I think we have a few in here. Yeah, uh, Mr. Elmer and Marie Britt, for you that do not know, and uh, they were catalysts in getting this congregation started. If you want to hear some neat stories about taking offerings and coffee cans, we've advanced to a basket <laughs> in 33 years. But they can tell you all kinds of stories uh, about that, meeting in a garage over in Winterville to start with, and... You know, just all the, uh, all the things that have transpired over the years because of faithful people uh, like the Brits. And we appreciate them and their faithfulness. I know Miss Margaret Smart is not, uh, I didn't see her. She's uh, another charter member of this. Uh, she's in the kitchen. Praise the Lord. Miss Margaret. But we appreciate those that, that started. And, and they start with the sole purpose, I believe, of saying, hey, we want to start a congregation. And when you read the papers that are there, for the growth of the kingdom, they wanted to grow. It says that in a lot of the papers, unless people were just saying it, for the sake of saying it. And it reminds me of the, uh, and, and, and sometimes that kind of scares and, and, and frightens people when, when, when those things begin to take place. It's, uh, it reminds me of the story of the three fellows that were in the 
weight room years ago when their babies were being born. And the nurse comes out, comes to the first fellow and says, congratulations, you're the father of twins. And he said, man, he said, that's amazing. He said, I work for the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> he comes out again, next guy, uh, and the nurse comes out, another nurse comes out, and comes to the next guy and said, you won't believe this, is amazing. there's something amazing going on back here. You're the father of triplets. He said, man, that is crazy. I work for the 3M company. <laughs> another nurse comes out, looks at the third guy, and said, where's such and such? Guy worked for the three year company said, he just jumped out of the window. <laughs> so how did jump out of the window? Said he works for seven up. <laughs> it scares people sometimes in that way. But when people are focused and they're doing the right thing, we're doing, we're being the church that God calls to be, the natural thing is when you grow spiritually, physical growth will come about and will continue to flourish in that way. And then it will cause people who are growing spiritually to go and invite somebody. That's a staggering statistic that only 2%, 2% of people in the church that claim to be Christians will invite someone during a year's time to go to church with them. That's crazy, 2%. If we just raise that to 5 and 10%, that would be a, a, a good jump. But... What we have to do is, uh, is, is, is do what this church did. Look at, um, I'm going to read several different uh, passages here. So uh, just bear with me and follow on the best that you can. Philippians chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible in it, just listen along. It says uh, in verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look, not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. <laughs> Verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Would you let your attitude be the same as that of Christ Jesus, is what's that saying? Verse 12 tells us in chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do all things. Listen to this. All of us need to listen to this. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. All authority was, uh, was God's. God gave all authority to Jesus in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus then gave authority to the apostles. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verse 42, the uh, church is built upon the apostles' doctrine. In Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about the apostles' doctrine and the foundation of the apostles' teaching. The Paul was an apostle called out of due time. Hopefully you're getting all this. And he said, so he is an apostle, and this is a command. He says, do all things without complaining and without dispute. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's a problem, man. I have to tell myself that all the time. Do everything without grumbling and without complaining. And I've told you before, I find myself, man, complaining about the complainers. Sometimes, you know, somebody complains, and then I'm complaining about them complaining, and this and all these. And Diddy's rebuking me all the time. She never complains. <laughs> no, you know, you know. Especially about me, never complains. <laughs> but do all things without complaining and without disputing. Listen, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's what crooked and perverse people do. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, when you want to participate in those things, you shine. You're different. And we're called to be different. Holding fast the word of life so that I may, rejo may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Listen to uh, chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> Paul writes all these things, he says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings 
being conformed to His death. If we are going to continue to be the church that God has called us to be, not just 33 years ago, but the one that was called in 33 A.D. as the church universal, we must continue to have a consuming passion to know Jesus and to be like Him. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You see, people need to see Jesus in us and see that we are different. There's a well-known Christian motivator, motivator, motivating speaker, and when he goes into a church, there's two questions that he asks. He says, what do you want and where are the men? Where are your men? What do you want and where are your men? He wants to know at the church, what are your goals? What is the fulfillment of your service? As Paul uh, did, he said, I want to know Him and His power. I want to know Him and His power. And the way to know Jesus better than anything is to be in His Word and consumed with Him. Read His Word. Be around people of like precious faith. Be around those who know the Word. And not only know it, but they're living it in their everyday lives. Be like Jesus. Have a passion to know. I have a passion for a lot of things. When I get into something, I'm passionate about it. Dee Dee calls me OCD. If I get it, if I get, if I decide I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. If it's running, when I got into running, I started running, kind of like Forrest Gump. I didn't stop. I just kept going. I get passionate about sports. I'm not very good at predicting things. You remember a couple, three weeks ago, I predicted the Panthers are going to go to the Super Bowl? I'm still there. Just wavering a little bit. But I made, in football, this weekend, this starting Thursday, I cheered for the Panthers, I cheered for University of Virginia, and I cheered for East Carolina University. All three were defeated. <laughs> Handle it. You do not want me cheering for your team. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I, you know, I'm passionate about those things, but I need to be more passionate about Jesus and, and, and knowing Him because we have victory through Him no matter what. He's given us the victory. We have a chance of uh, eternal life in heaven with Him if we will be passionate about Him. And when people see there is a true difference in our lives. And then we understand it's not about us. It's about Jesus and what He would have us to do. Think of others above yourself. And then it goes on to say, this is what Jesus did. You ever thought about that? I believe I believe with all my heart that Jesus the Christ is the Son of the living God. I've shared that. I, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be up here. I'll tell you that. But I believe it with all my heart. And I believe that He was in heaven and the glories of heaven and all that He had in heaven and He left that to come here. You think he was uncomfortable? Yeah. Definitely. He left, the, he left everything to come be born in a manger. To be born in a town of Bethlehem, a small rural town. To live this life, to be persecuted, to be put down, to be nailed to a cross, to be bit, beaten and whipped and have a crown of thorns placed on his head. All of those things, He did that for us. He humbled Himself and thought of you and He thought of me before Himself. At His fingertips, I mentioned again, last, I mentioned it last week, but at His fingertips, He could have at any time put a stop to the plan. He could have said, I'm stopping this. He could have looked into the future and said, DJ Maxi is not worth it. He's not worth dying for. He's going to let me down time and time again. Or this person not worth dying for. The church, I'm, I'm not, I, we don't need this. I'm going to stop it. He could have when they were there and they were mocking him and all the things. At any time, he could have put a stop to it. But he didn't. He was thinking about others first. And the scripture tells us that's what we are to do. What part of that don't we fully understand? See, because... For some reason, naturally, we're selfish. We are. In marriage relationships, we're selfish. In, in all relationships, we're selfish. Dee Dee bought me uh, the other day Boston baked beans. 
I love Boston baked eggs, man. That thing's good. Ain't nothing but sugar with a taste of peanut. <laughs> I mean, I love them, man. You should go to, you go to the movies and it's like $29 for a box of Boston baked eggs. That's the only place you can get, man. The, the dollar stores and all that stuff. I love them. And then she bought me some sprees. You know what I'm talking about? Sprees. And uh, she was making up with me because she was mean to me the night before. And, uh, so she bought me some sprees. And I had my sprees on the counter, right? And then Eli comes up, he's like, he walks in the kitchen. And it's like a radar, the boy's like a radar when he comes. He will not eat, I mean, you can have steak, potatoes, I mean, all kinds of stuff on the table, and he's going to find the candy. And he found it, he's like, all I heard was, ooh, spree. I said, ho, 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 ho. Those are my screws. <laughs> Don't touch my screws. And I'm on my lane in my screws. And then I went and I sat down and felt bad. So I said, all right, man, you have a couple. I come in later on, there's two screws. <laughs> Boy, can't count. I pay extra sitting by the school, can't count. I love it when two. <laughs> but I'm selfish, you know, I was like, oh, those are mine. My daughter, I go in her room. And I'm like, you need to clean your room. She said, why? This is my room. I said, ho, 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 ho. This is my room. Would you like to go see the papers? I'll go pull the papers on the mortgage and I will show you who owns this home. That's the bank. <laughs> But anyway, it is her. I allow her to live in that room. But everything becomes mine. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. What's the bar? I'm like, all right, man, if I let you borrow my stuff, man. What's the stuff? But we get, we get selfish with that. We're naturally selfish. This is mine, mine, mine. Or we, we care mostly about ourselves and not about other people. And Scripture says that as we grow spiritually, when we become spiritual minded, we will lose that selfishness that we have that is natural for some reason. And we'll begin to lose that as we get closer to Jesus and more like Him and we'll think of others first. And we'll realize, hey, what I have, if somebody needs a bar, they can bar. If somebody wants a spree, I'll give them a spree. If somebody wants them to borrow their scooter and wreck it in the churchyard, they'll let them do it. <laughs> And the least we can do when we say we name Jesus Christ Lord of our lives and we put the name on us, I am a Christian. That means I am of Christ and I belong to Christ. That means I'm going to think of others above myself. Others first. And if we're going to grow, then we're going to think of others first and we're going to say, hey man, I want people to have the same hope, the same peace, the same joy that I have. I'm going to invite them to church. I'm going to invite them to this revival. I'm going to invite them to this activity, to this activity, the men's first men's ministry. I'm going to get them around this so that they can experience what I am and have experienced in my life. We need to humble ourselves and get past ourselves and become Jesus. John 1, 4 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 10.10 10 says, I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You've got to have compassion and that type of passion and compassion for others and for Jesus. It leads to an overflowing love for others in Christ. And so the, let's take this message with us and not merely be hearers of the Word of God. Let's do as the Scripture says and do as I this illustration is powerful, one that I've used before, but it's, it's so true. Alexander the Great conquered the known world at his particular time. 
when he would go into battle, he would go and he would overtake a country, a group of people. And if he had anybody who they would have people that would look out for those that would not fight or were cowards in battle that were in his own. One particular time they brought a young boy in front of Alexander the Great. And he stood before Alexander the Great and he had hid during battle. And he refused to fight. And Alexander the Great said, young man, said, what's your name? And the boy looking down said, my name is Alexander, sir. Alexander the Great said, I couldn't hear you. He said, what is your name? The boy said, my name is Alexander, sir. Alexander the Great said, I want you to look into my eyes. And I want you to speak up and I want you to tell me what your name is. And that young boy, about 17, 18 years old, looked into the eyes of Alexander the Great. He said, my name is Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great grabbed that young boy by his cloak and threw him to the ground and stood over top of him. And he looked at him and he said, boy, you change your ways or you change your name. Because the name Alexander was associated with greatness. The name Alexander was associated with someone who was not afraid to fight. He didn't want anything to do with somebody who had his name who was a coward. Many of us claim to be Christians. Many of us wear that name proudly. What's your religion? I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. But the name Christian means that you are of Christ and that means that you belong to Christ. That means you are like Christ. And if that means you are like Christ, then you want His church to be the best that it can possibly be. You want His church to flourish and to grow and to minister to people and to disciple people and to take people from where they are to where they need to be. That is what a Christian is. A Christian is of Christ and belongs to Christ. That means they love God. That means they love others and they think of others above themselves and they humble themselves and put their interests and their, their what they want behind on the back burner. And they go for what is best for the kingdom of God and what is the best for others. So we need to make the decision that we as Christians are going to live for Him. And if we're not, change your name. Don't wear the name Christian and then not be striving to live like Him and to be like Him. Or don't, or you need to have the attitude as a Christian. I get to be like Jesus. I want and desire to be like Him. There's no better place on earth than the road that leads to heaven. Jesus gives us hope. He gives us peace. He is where eternal life is found. And that's why we need to share that with others. And so today. If you are not a Christian, we're going to give you that opportunity here in just a few moments to come to Christ. And if I have to beg, I'll beg you. If I need to sit down and talk with you and debate you, I'll debate you. If we need to sit down and open, I'll open with you, I'll study with you. And But I want, want you to know that the only way to have true life and a good life and abundant life is a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You can look in all kinds of places. You can look anywhere and everywhere you want to look. You will not find the answer except through Jesus. I could get tons and tons of people to come up here and to testify to that fact. Some of you in here think, man, you don't understand. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad man. I'm a bad woman. Guess what? I can find somebody bad. <laughs> I can sign, find somebody better that, that came under the grace of Jesus Christ and they have hope now. I know people that shot people. I baptized a man one time. He said, man, I've done some things in my life. I've done different things. You know, all these things. I baptized him into Christ all these. One day he was talking to me. He said, man, you know, I, I shot and killed a man. I was like, woo! He told me that beforehand, buddy. <laughs> Somebody's done it. But guess what? God's grace 
grace is enough. And it covers that. And you don't need to keep trying to look and say, well, I'm going to find my happiness and my peace and put my past behind me through this and through that and through all these different things that the world has to offer. Don't get drunk on the things of the world. Get drunk on the Spirit of God. That's what the Scripture says and it means. Don't be drunk on wine, but be drunk on the Spirit. And so we need to get drunk on the Spirit of God and intoxicated with His Spirit, with His Word, and consumed with Jesus. And if you need to make that decision, you can do that today. The Bible says, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins. And that's, that's saying, no longer my Lord, but Jesus Christ is Lord. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and be baptized, immersed into Christ with the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of God's Holy Spirit and you're raised to walk in a new life. And then you work out your salvation daily as we read earlier. And you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus on a daily basis. And you get to and you want to serve Him the closer you get to Him. Maybe today you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. This is a homecoming. Maybe you need to come home. Maybe you wander like a prodigal son and you've gone away and you like the ways of this world. Maybe you become selfish again and it's become all about you. And you need to come back. I know there's things I need to repent of. I'm gonna, I, I can do that while I'm here privately. I don't necessarily have to come forward. But some may just say, I, you know what? I need to come forward. I need to be accountable to this congregation. And I need them to pray for me. And that's what we're here for, to build up and to encourage. Maybe that's where you are. You need to rededicate your life. Maybe you're part of the church universal, but you haven't plugged into a local body yet. And you're looking for a church home. We'd love to be your church home. I tell people all the time, we're not perfect, but we're healthy. And we're going to keep on growing and we're going to keep on going. I'm going to push you. I'm going to make you mad at times. Somebody here is going to make you mad. But you keep your eyes focused on Jesus and He'll never let you down. But we're a family. And just like I fight for my wife sometimes and fight for my children, we're going to rub each other the wrong way sometimes. But I still love my wife. I still love my children. They're still my family. And the people here, even though sometimes you rub me the wrong way, I rub you the wrong way, I still love you. And we're still going to love you. We're still going to care for you. We're still going to work through things because we are a family. The family of God. The household of God, as Paul tells us through the book of Timothy. And so if you want to be part of that, if you want to be a part of a church that's going somewhere, that's doing something, then where you can get plugged in, then the Eastern Pines Church of Christ is the place for you. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need some spiritual counseling. Maybe you don't know exactly what you need. You just come up and say, I don't know what I need. I just need somebody to talk to. We'll be here for you. But I'm going to pray. I'm going to sing our song of invitation, our song of decision. Whatever decision you have to make, if you will come forward during that time, I'll be up here waiting for you. But it's an invitation not to come to me. It's an invitation to come to Jesus. Father God, we come to you once again and we thank you for this time that we've had of worship to you. We do pray that everything that we've said and done has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. <clears throat> it has been, as your word says, a sweet aroma going before your throne. But we ask, uh, ask right now that your spirit will continue to work through your word. Some of us in here, uh, God, we complain a lot. We look out for our interests more than the interests of others. We haven't humbled ourselves. We haven't. We look at our lives and we're not becoming more like you. We're becoming less like you. We claim to be Christians. And I pray that that's the case that we'll change our ways. Not necessarily name, but we'll change our ways and we'll come back to you and we'll have that desire to live for you once again. Some of you for the very first time need to come to you. They need to come and, and experience uh, the joy and the peace that they can have in a right relationship with you. And I'm praying for that person now. Pray you give them the boldness and courage to come forward and to, and to make that decision with you today. Some need prayer and other things. And so, God, I just I'm praying this prayer with faith and with expectation. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.